we'll actually redraw this circle system. Um, so we've lost it up there. And we'll draw it more like a circle this time as well. Ideally, you should be able to sketch this out really quickly just by drawing a circle and then adding these seven components. So number one is your CO2 absorber. You'll have your fresh gas flow as your second component, a unidirectional inspiratory valve, and then your Y piece and an expiratory valve. And then we'll have our bagger and our APL valve where our gas is vented off from. So this APL valve is the adjustable pressure limiting valve. It's usually a conveniently located dial uh, with the numbers 0 to 70 centimeters of water on it and it allows you to control the pressure inside this circuit um, and, and limit the max pressure anywhere in that range. So if you set it to 20 centimeters of water it will make sure that no pressure in this circuit accumulates more than 20 centimeters of water. Then if there was um, extra pressure in this circuit, it would go off or it would leave the circuit through the APL valve and go to your scavenging unit, which disposes of the waste anesthetic gas. Um, so some tips for this APL valve is to keep it open. So some tips for this APL valve, um, keep it open for spontaneous ventilation. It can be uncomfortable for patients to uh, breathe against um, the constant pressure unless you're intentionally raising it to have a little bit of CPAP. Use a max of 20 centimeters of water for bagging. Beyond that you have a much higher chance of gastric insufflation because you've essentially broken the seal of the lower esophageal sphincter. That being said, if you are having difficulty bagging a patient, it makes sense to set this much higher because your primary concern is actually delivering air uh, or oxygen to the patient down here. And draw them in here. Here's a mask right now, but it could be an endotracheal tube. And then setting this APL valve to something higher, maybe 50 or 70, would ensure that all of the pressure is going towards um, the patient rather than um, being vented off through the APL valve. Then the other thing to say about this on vent mode. So when you switch over to the vent from your um, bagging mode, the APL valve is no longer engaged. Instead, uh, the ventilator has uh, the ability to control the pressure that's allowed in the circuit which makes sense because it wouldn't be very good if you had your APL valve set to zero and then the uh, vent wouldn't be able to deliver any pressure. Just keep this in mind though, when you switch the patient back to some type of spontaneous ventilation mode after they've been on the ventilator, sometimes you can forget what your last APL valve setting was at um, and then you'll switch them over and you'll see the pressure uh, starting to climb up in the circuit because your APL valve is still set to something high. So let's say you last had it on 20 centimeters of water for bagging, the pressure in your circuit and the patient's lungs will eventually climb up to be at 20 centimeters of water and then it will just be held there until you change your APL setting. Lastly, the reservoir or this bag is designed as a collapsible bag and it's useful because then you can look at it and feel it to tell what the pressure is in the circuit. It's useful for uh, looking at and feeling the air pressure in the circuit. And so if the bag looks empty, then that suggests to you that there is a leak. If there is a leak, just take a systematic approach from the patient to your anesthetic machine and uh, try to identify any common problems that occur. I'll just take over this drawing to list a couple of these things. Unless there's something unusual going on inside the patient like a pneumothorax or a bronchopleural fistula with a chest tube in place, your, le your leak is not likely inside the patient. So your next reasonable location to check is uh, the cuff inside the endotracheal tube. 
Make sure this is sufficiently inflated and then where your endotracheal tube attaches to your circuit, make sure that connection is tight. Your sample line will be on here and just make sure that the sample line is screwed on tightly. There will be an elbow and a filter in here. Um, so again, checking those connections and then there could technically be a leak anywhere in this tubing, but that would be very difficult to spot check the connections of this tubing to the anesthetic machine, so both the um, inlet and the outlet, to make sure they're firmly in place. Other common sources would be that if the CO2 absorber is not screwed in properly, there could be a leak there. Or if there's a hole in your reservoir bag that is small, it could leak through there. Of course, if your APL valve is set to zero and you're not actually allowing pressure to build up in your circuit, you might think there's a leak until you realize that you're still set to zero. If all of those things seem normal, um, hopefully you can just turn up your fresh gas flows temporarily to, until you've figured out what the source of the leak is. And this will compensate by bringing new air in to replace all the air that's leaking out of your circuit somewhere. If you're still just bagging the patient, there's an extremely high chance that it is just the seal around the mask on the patient here because it can be hard to get a good seal and then you'll be leaking out of the side here. When this happens, people instinctively reach for the APL valve and will turn this up to 70 so that um, they have less air leaving the circuit. And I mean, certainly that will prevent air from leaving the APL valve, but it doesn't help with this leak that you have. So your real solution to this is getting a better seal with your mask and actually turning up your fresh gas flow because you need to replace air that's leaving this circuit either through here or through the APL. If you crank your fresh gas flow up to 15 liters per minute it only takes four seconds to add a liter uh, to the circuit which is enough to distend this bag and for you to try to give the patient another breath. Anyways I'll stop there um, hopefully you can uh, pretty easily sketch out this circle system now and if you're having a hard time remembering what order the components are in Try to remember a couple things to help you orient yourself in this diagram. So the valves uh, obviously have to be close to the patient. So they're just going to be on either side of this Y connection. That Y piece is as close to the patient as possible. It's going to be extremely close to patient. The fresh gas flow um, is going to be after the CO2 absorber, and close to the inspiratory limb. That makes sense because you want your, uh, your fresh gas or the new gas that's coming through to be what gets to the patient first. And you also want to try to minimize the gas flow through the CO2 absorber wherever possible. So it's better if you just send all this new gas flow um, directly through closer to the uh, unidirectional inspiratory valve than anything. Your APL is going to be before your CO2 absorber. Remember that your CO2 absorber has a sort of limited capacity to remove CO2 from the system. So if you're going to be venting off any extra air, you should do that before it runs through the CO2 absorber. Otherwise, um, imagine if this was after your CO2 absorber, it would run through, use up some of these granules, and then um, leave the system anyways. So Theoretically, you're preserving the function of your CO2 absorber by having your APL first. And then uh, it makes sense to have your bag and vent um, by the APL valve. One thing that's probably tempting is to draw this bag or reservoir right before the patient because you like to think that you're squeezing air directly into the patient. But in reality, what you're doing is you are squeezing this bag and creating pressure that's sent through this entire system onto the patient. So with those things in mind, you should be able to recreate this drawing pretty easily. Um, really the only other things in, in the system that we haven't talked about, um, things like filters, there's going to be the scavenger, which I think I alluded to, but that's what happens after this APL valve so that you're not just throwing off your waste anesthetic gas into the OR. Um, your sample line, which I've actually shown, but we're not 
considering it part of this, and uh, the ventilator. So I'll talk about ventilator types in the next video and how to use them as well.